There we go. Fame and fortune. I wanted to share the book with you, but I hope you remember that I'm not a scientist or even a science major. The last time I took physics was in grade 11, and I have still got nightmares about the lighthouse whose height I had to determine. But one reviewer said the book was witty and lucid, which for me meant that the book was interesting, relatively easy to read, and the author is someone we could take to Montana's after a Mississauga Center meeting. She's funny. And it's always good to chuckle when you're reading about the complete destruction of everything. But let us begin. And I've included some pictures, not from her book, but from the internet, so that you wouldn't fall asleep just listening to me. <laughs> and it's not moving. Oh, it's moving quickly. OK, what am I doing wrong? Try your up cursor, down cursor. I am. And it doesn't want to work at all. Left, right arrows. Try the left or right arrows. No. You may have to oh, click I, on, may have to click click on the image. image. Yeah. There we, there we go. Why is it not behaving? Slide 43. Yes. So click on the screen and then use the arrows. Well, that was really good. I that was great. <laughs> Can I try that again? Yeah, I, I would un, un, uh, unshare. Stop share. And let's try it again. OK, I don't even know where my screen is, though. End of slide. Click Wendy, to exit. If you, if you press the home button on your keyboard, it'll take you to slide one, if there's a home button somewhere. There isn't. That's got to be the fastest show I've ever seen in history. <laughs> well, this is a pain in the you know what. Yeah, no, we're we're very patient. Let's just uh, let's just fix it. <laughs> so go into your presentation before you share and just get back to sc uh, first screen. Okay, I'm on the first screen. Am I sharing? No, not yet. Now share your screen. Okay, except that I can't because I've lost you. At the bottom of your yeah no I've got it there we go <sighs> we're going to try this again okay oh I'm going to do Yay. play from the start yep okay now I'm going to ah yes <laughs> there we go now I'm going to retire now, oh. now if you hit the down arrow do you, does it go to your next screen Yes. Okay, you're all set. Good. Okay, so Katie Mack, let's get back to her. Uh, she's a 40-year-old cosmologist, and I know cosmology is Andy, uh, Randy's favorite. Uh, she's an assistant professor at North Carolina State University. She writes regularly for magazines such as Sky and Telescope. Her mother is a fan of science fiction and encouraged Katie to watch Star Trek and Star Wars, a mother after my own heart. Her grandfather worked on the Apollo 11 mission. Katie quotes Robert Frost, and I think it's nice to have a literary reference. Some say the world will end in fire, some say ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. Katie agrees, but she reminds us that while her book discusses five possibilities for the end of the world, science now agrees that this universe will end. We all want to look at where we come from, whether it's the house we grew up in or the city we came from. And for us, it's the Big Bang. But studying, studying how everything will end, our eventual destiny, may help us to understand our very existence. And that's somebody else's philosophical thought from the book. Science can now analyze and map the glow of the early cosmos. We can see the Big Bang. So where do we go from here? Where do we go from looking at our beginning? Well, let's look at some possible endings. The big crunch. In four billion years, our galaxy, the Milky Way, and our neighbor, the Andromeda galaxy, will collide, let's say merge. But lots of galaxies collide and absorb smaller ones. However, this is becoming rare because the universe is expanding and we believe that this expansion is accelerating. 
But if we've been expanding since the Big Bang, will that expansion reverse and our universe rush towards a big crunch? If so, the radiation produced by such a collapse will ignite the very service of stars. A collapsing universe will obliterate everything, but can it bounce back and start again? And if the answer is yes, what would survive in the un universe? Physical principles or new ones? Heat death. Now this is a real winner. Again, Katie talks about the expansion of the universe. And I like the big numbers. Something that could have sent light to us 13.8 billion years ago has moved far away in the expansion of the universe and would now be 45 billion light years from us. Big numbers and that's expansion. Galaxies whose distant past is now visible to us will move further away and fade from sight. Galaxies will become more isolated until there are no more collisions, no new stars, and stars will fade into darkness and even black holes will evaporate. And don't you feel depressed already? Now we're moving on to the big rip. Katie explains that dark matter clumps around galaxies and dominates gravitation fields, even bending light. Dark energy exists everywhere and is the dominant component of the universe. This stretches out space. But as space gets bigger due to expansion, the amount of dark energy increases to keep the density constant. And if this sounds like I know what I'm talking about, you're wrong. But Katie seems to know, and it made sense when I read it. Now, with the big rip, things start to unravel. Galaxies become too far apart and start floating away. The Milky Way fades, planets spiral outwards. We drift from the sun, the moon, from Earth. Blackness everywhere, but the expanding space, even within our planet, causes the Earth to explode. Molecules crack, nuclei go poof, and the very fabric of space is ripped away. But by then, all the structure in the universe is gone anyway. Katie thinks this could happen in 200 billion years. I feel better. Next one is bounce. Gravity is apparently weak. Did I know that? No. But why? Perhaps it's leaking into another dimension. So now we're talking about multi-dimensions. After the Big Bang, maybe a collision of two dimensions. They drift off, expanding until they reach their maximum expansion, and then they are attracted back to bounce off each other. This bounce destroys everything in the two dimensions, creates a new Big Bang, and off go two dimensions. This version is a universe that is eternal and cataclysmic. And this picture looks like two fish kissing. Never mind two complete destructions of the universe. Now, I like the picture, but I don't like the vacuum decay. Katie says that the balanced set of laws that govern our world is not stable. I don't find that cheery. Vacuum decay just needs a trigger, something like an ultra high energy explosion or the final evaporation of a black hole. It could happen anywhere in the universe, but when it does, poof, it would obliterate everything. It could happen now, but Katie thinks not for trillions of years, by which time we will have bounced, crunched, and done heaven only knows what else. But getting closer to us, our sun. While Katie is looking into our very distant future, remember that in approximately five billion years, after our collision with Andromeda, our beloved sun will become a red giant. It will swallow Mercury, Venus, and leave Earth charred and lifeless. I'm hoping to live to be 10 squared, so five billion years really isn't on my radar, and maybe we'll all be pure energy by then. You can tell I watched a Star Trek episode last month. We have new tools, the James Webb Telescope, for example, to discover our origins and our future. So is our universe closed and thus recollapsing or open and just expanding? Katie at the end says that someday in the, in the distant future, the sun will expand, the earth will die, and the cosmos will end. However, she is an optimist, and she does believe that until then, humanity will explore, learn, share, and ask, what's next? I really enjoyed the book. I recommend it highly and it has the ultimate seal of approval 
from Chris Malecki, who also read it and enjoyed it. And that is me. Excellent. Oops, gone. Okay, now I just have to get back to you. Thank you, Wendy. That's uh, that was awesome. In Good. spite of uh, Chris's seal of approval. <laughs> but don't ask any scientific questions because I don't know the answers. Um, okay, does anyone have any really difficult questions? For <laughs> Chris will answer them all. I, I am here. Um, I did read the book and I thought it was really, really good. Um, I, I don't pretend to know um, any more than what uh, when Wendy is saying um, about the book, but uh, I found out about the book because there was a book review in Astronomy Magazine and they highly recommended the book. So I just went to Mississauga Library, reserved it and read it for free and really enjoyed it. So that's, that's an easy way to read this. So okay. I, I do highly recommend the book. Okay. Does anyone have any really <laughs> extremely difficult questions for Wendy? Just don't ask me about vacuum decay because that I didn't understand. Well, the atom bomb was supposed to have, <laughs> as I wrote in oh. my no note here, there was thought that in 1945 at Alamogordo in New Mexico, the first atom bomb could have started a vacuum decay and destroy the earth and the universe. That's what some people were concerned about. Fortunately, that did not happen because we're still here. That is yes. like the Large Hadron Collider can create many black holes and people are worried all the time. My question is, did she talk about if, if we're expanding and uh, we're now talking about the multiverse. How, like, does gravity all of a sudden, the gravitational constant change when we get too large and that sucks us back? Did she discuss that transition? She, no. you, you had a graphic up. Yeah. Um, she kept stressing how weak gravity was. And I'm going, really? Um, and that these, there might be more than one dimension and the gravity's leaking in, into multi dimensions and that right. they, the, the gravity, whatever there was, seemed to be attracting those dimensions back towards each other so that they would bounce. And she had a, like a, two paragraphs about having her hands together and, and doing the bounce that way. I tried. I could not get a bounce. Um, Wendy, did she have any sort of bias to any of the theories? Not really. Uh, other than it's going, the universe will end. We all agree on that. And I'm not going to be here. Um, but it was, it was interesting and she's funny. So as you're reading it and she's kind of throwing out all these humorous <coughs> comments, it, may, it makes it easier to read about the fact that we're, you know, the entire universe will be destroyed at some point. I like the part where we come back and we can have new principles. And I thought, and my spirit, I'm sure, will be one of the new things that, that's back in the new one. Perfect. And I'm going with that. <laughs> um, um, Wendy, did she, did Katie speak about quantum mechanics or anywhere? Did she touch on quantum mechanics in the book? Because um, just, just thinking out loud, you know, I think science requires a better understanding of quantum mechanics to get a better picture of the universe and how it ends. So did, does she touch on? I think she mentioned the word. Okay. And that's about as much as it was. Got it. <laughs> Perfect. All right, Wendy, thank you very much for this. And uh, uh, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Pause, every, show your, uh, your appreciation by your reactions and you can applaud and there you go. <laughs> um, no, th I, think, I think book reviews are really, really interesting because it, it, you know, we're always looking for interesting uh, books to read. Uh, the neat thing about Katie Mack is that, you know, she did talk at the GA last year and, and Recently, I, you know, we, we saw that she's going to be spending some time at the Perimeter Institute in Waterloo. Uh, so I think it's worthwhile to sort of reach out to her and, and you know, when things get back to normal, maybe, uh, uh, you know, we can have some sort of, uh, you know, public uh, event where she can come and tell us how we're all going to die, um, you know, just terrible deaths. And, and we can we, take her drinking uh, after that. Or, yeah, exactly. You know, that's the main thing. Like, we're all going to die. So. <laughs> Might as well go out drinking, um, but no, she's uh, um, she's recognized and she's uh, well known, and uh, uh, appreciate the book review. So thanks again, Wendy.
Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Shreya Naik. Shreya, you want to? Uh, do you need to share a screen, or what? Uh, what do you need? Hi, Randy. Um, yeah, I'm going to be sharing my screen. Okay. I have a PowerPoint. Okay. As as she does that, I want to tell you that Shreya recently, uh, you know, she's a grade 12 student and recently volunteered to help us with our social media, and so we've been uh, really pouring out some. Uh, Post mm -hmm. on our RAC Mississauga um, social media uh, platforms and especially on uh, uh, Instagram. Yes. And uh, mm -hmm. what's interesting is we've been using a lot of amazing astrophotos from our uh, a speaker who's uh, after Shreya, so it's uh, it's kind of neat uh, mm -hmm. to see that. But uh, uh, Shreya, I want to thank you uh, and let everyone know I appreciate the. Uh, the volunteer work you've done to help us with this. Um, no worries, Randy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's really fun to do it. I, I, I love designing these kinds oh, of God. things. I'm, so. I'm glad because I'm kind of yeah. clueless <laughs> in this respect. So, um, All right, so Shreya is going to talk about uh, the sky in February, which is something we like to touch upon. Um, uh, okay, that shouldn't be me. Um, uh, we like to sort of talk about what's in the sky and, and hopefully the February skies are going to clear up a little bit. And, uh... mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so good evening members. There we go. Good. Uh, All yours. Okay. Just wanted to make sure you guys can see the screen and hear my voice very clearly. You are good. Okay, great. Thank you. So things to look for in the night sky for the month of February. Uh, what will I go over today? So as expected, not many exciting events will happen this month of February. Although that being said, we do have a few events uh, which are rare and interesting for stargazers and telescope users. Um, so I'm gonna get started by talking about Jupiter followed by Venus and finally the phases of the moon. Okay, Venus at greatest illuminated extent. So Venus will reach its greatest illuminated extent and will boost its brightness to a brilliant magnitude, roughly negative 5.0, um, after rising at about 4.30 a.m. local time on February 12th, which is tomorrow morning. Uh, Venus will be visible in the southeastern pre-dawn sky uh, near the constellation of Sagittarius, um, just a palm's width uh, to the upper left of reddish Mars. So if you miss it tomorrow morning, Venus will appear nearly as bright on the following morning. Jupiter departs for the time being. With the departure of Saturn and Venus over the past two months, uh, Jupiter is the only bright planet left in our twilight skies in February, and it's on its way out. Uh, the giant planet stands alone low in the western sky um, after sunset in February, and by mid-month, mid it's setting only about an hour after the sun. Stay warm under a full snow moon. The full snow moon, a reflection of the northern hemisphere's snowiest month, reaches its peak at 11.59 a.m. Eastern time on February 16th. Um, and again, Venus at its brightest. So uh, enjoy the crescent Venus, that is um, the planet at its brightest. And look for uh, Venus to form a trio with the moon and Mars on the morning of February 26th. And finally, we have the phases of moon in the month of February. So we already had our new moon on the 1st. Our full moon is on the 16th, and we go back to new moon on the 28th. So Randy was just talking about our social media accounts. I decided to put this onto my presentation just in case if any of our members are not following it. So we have an Instagram account, a Facebook, and a Twitter account for our RESC Mississauga Center. Um, on those accounts, uh, you'll find informative posts, um, you'll find updates about our meetings, um, and you'll see some really great astrophotography photos by one of our members, Adriano, so thank you so much for that. And that's the end. Thank you, that's great. Um, thank you so much. Yeah, so, um, one thing that, that uh, is kind of an interesting project um, is if you uh, have a window in your house that uh, looks towards where the sun sets, 
And uh, you probably know that uh, we have one where, you know, if you're doing the initiatives, you look out and you can see the sunset at various points. And so, of course, the sun um, reached its farthest southern point uh, December 21st, and it begins to move uh, north very, very slowly. And I'm not sure what, there, there's got to be a name for this process, how, you know, the, uh, turn my video on here, but, um, you know, the, the, the the sun sort of follows its point and then gets down in, in Sagittarius and sort of hangs in that lower area for the longest point mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. begins to move up and then just starts to fly. And it's sort of the March, April time frame or the, you know, August, September time frame where it just flies and, and the, the sunset times change very radically and the azimuth of the sunrise or sunset point changes radically. So we're sort of coming into that now, sort of mid-February tends to be the point where everyone notices that, hey, you know, it's six o'clock and it's still twilight out. You know, maybe oh. we'll be able to get out of this uh, this winter uh, doldrum pretty soon. So mm -hmm. over the next mm -hmm. month, that's definitely something to watch is the uh, position of the sunset or sunrise uh, over, uh, over the next month. And uh, mm -hmm. before you know it, we'll be into the vernal equinox. And, uh, and uh, even through the vernal equinox, it just it just seems to fly. So that's something that that's kind of neat to watch, and uh, um, you know, something you might you might notice. Any uh, questions for Shri? Thank you, Shri. Any questions for her about uh, her talk or uh, the uh, uh, February skies? Of course, uh, still a little cold, but uh, well, warming up, which is kind of nice. Unfortunately, we've lost our uh, our uh, our major um, planets. Although uh, I wasn't actually, I wasn't sure that Jupiter was still uh, visible. So that's kind of cool. any questions. Yes, hello, Liz. I'm mute. There we go. Hi. Hi. Uh Thanks, Shariah. That was that was really good, actually. It was really, really nice. And I have that. I have a calendar here just behind me, actually, with the the phases of the moon on it, which I got, which was really delightful. Um, mm. I, I wanted to ask you this. You know, you told us about all these things that are going on, uh, at like half past four in the morning and stuff. Are you gonna go out and see any of those things yourself? Um, I don't think I will. <laughs> um, four thirty in the morning, <laughs> a little early for me. Uh, yeah, it's, but that, maybe, it's sad, yeah, isn't it? You know, it's a bit, a bit we can't do it in the middle of the day, and then we get to see it all lovely and all that. <laughs> right. Very, very busy with um, schoolwork and whatnot, and I'm not an early riser either. <laughs> um, so maybe in the future, yeah. I definitely do read articles about it. Um, so, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I just wondered if you were going to be so bold as to get out there at those <laughs> ungodly hours and... You know. I mean, I, it happens to us all the time. It happens to me all, you know, you think, oh, wouldn't it be great to see that? And then you don't see it because it's three o'clock, four o'clock. Yeah, it's the worst. <laughs> you set the alarm and then you don't get out of bed. You know, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Will you be um, rising up early and looking at it? I'm full of ambition. But I see Keith Jarvis killing himself laughing. Yeah, really. I love the speaker on it. <laughs> You know, always dream, can't we? Mm -hmm. It's also bloody cold. <laughs> I, I had a similar question, Shri, uh, although more to perhaps the evening hours. Uh, do you manage to get out? Maybe not. And, and what's, do you, are you a visual observer, binoculars, telescope? What sort of things do you enjoy having a chance to see? Um, as of right now, I don't really have a telescope or binoculars. Um, but I think about last year, I borrowed a telescope from the center and I was just uh, trying to figure it out, trying to use it, um, you know, using the instructions manual and whatnot. And I actually, um, I'm starting to look at basic objects. So I'm starting to um, look at the moon. I first want to master, um, you know, 
observing the moon um, the right way, taking pictures preferably. So I'm just building on that. Very good. Your, your, mm -hmm. your map of the uh, phases of the moon has reminded me, it's very convenient. The end of the month is the next new moon. Uh, let's hope for some uh, warmer weather and clearer weather by then. Uh, yes, I for sure. Not much over the winter, but I, I, I would really like to get out uh, perhaps towards the beginning of uh, March to, to do some viewing. So, and if we start having events, for instance, the one that Randy's mentioned at U of T, then maybe there'll be an opportunity safely for us to get together, uh, see each other and, uh, and also help the community. Mm -hmm. That'd be amazing. I'd definitely love to join. Yeah. Enjoyed your talk. Shreve. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I've got a comment for Liz. You, can, you actually can see Venus during the day, so you don't have to get up at 4.30 in the morning. Oh. But you got to okay. know where to look. All right, where am I looking then, Fred? In the right place. <laughs> <laughs> up the wrong place. <laughs> Thank you, Fred. <laughs> that, that narrows it down. That really narrows it down in a whole sky of the universe. <laughs> I mean, it's only the sky, for heaven's sake. Yeah. Maybe, uh, maybe if you just you, know, can actually, actually, you can actually do it with a toilet paper roll if you know where to look and block out the sun. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like close to know what I use them for. <laughs> just make sure you take the toilet paper off. Yeah. You look a little odd outside with that. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, just the roll itself, you look fine. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, you're ready. <laughs> All right, Ms. Shreya, thank you very much. Uh, I, I do uh, admit that, you know, when I got interested in astronomy and started thinking about night sky and whatever, uh, there were a couple people in the Toronto Center who were adamant solar, solar observers. And after a while, I figured it out. I knew why they were solar observers, because they could do everything during the day. And that, uh, it made so much sense to me, so. Uh, we do have an amazing solar telescope, so if anyone's interested, uh, uh, you can borrow it and, uh, and do some solar observing. Shariah, thank you very much. And again, thank you for uh, helping out with uh, our social media. We're really trying to expand our uh, presence on social media. So if anyone else yes. has any experience uh, with that, uh, then uh, please, please let us know uh, because uh, it's a great opportunity to promote the, the club. And uh, Shariah is just a, an expert on this. So uh, again, thank you very much. Thank you, Randy. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I'm, as I mentioned, uh, we, we had some posts <clears throat> recently uh, that were uh, spread out to uh, look at various uh, interesting deep sky objects. And all of these uh, photographs were taken by our next speaker, uh, Adriano Almeida, who's a uh, a member of the center. And the interesting thing about uh, Adriano's uh, experience, or I guess journey through all of this, is that he's relatively new to uh, astrophotography. And, uh, you know, he's very, um, he's willing and he, he volunteered to, uh, to talk about his experience and his, I, I look at it as a journey because I've been an astrophotographer for for quite a while. It is a journey. It's sort of an accumulation and experience, and you know, sort of building upon you know success and failure and all that kind of thing. Uh, but the whole aspect of, of astrophotography has changed so much in the last uh, 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 you know 40, 50 years, uh, going from film to uh, to digital to uh, all these various techniques and whatever. And uh, I really think that the astrophotographer, amateur astrophotographers today are taking photographs that uh, were unheard of back uh, even 40, 50 years ago with prof professional uh, uh, equipment. And it's amazing to see, I mean, and we all share it on, on various uh, social media platforms. Uh, and, uh, you know, looking at Sky News and the, the astrophotography contest and, and, and the amazing uh, experienced astrophotographers across the country. Uh, but, uh, you know, Adriano has uh, um, really reached a point where he's, he's doing great work and uh, he's uh, agreed to share this with us tonight. 
So Adriana, thank you very much. And uh, I'll, I'll pass it over to you to, uh, to uh, share your story with us. And I'm looking forward to it. Hey, thank you, Randy. And it's great to meet everyone. Finally, I, um, I have to apologize first and foremost because I've been a member since late last year. And um, Fridays, unfortunately, are terrible for me. And I didn't realize that these were all going on before that. Uh, but this is my first time uh, joining. And um, I, I'm one of these astrophotographers, uh, astronomers that sort of came into this during the pandemic. I'm one of those people that's responsible for making uh, all this equipment impossible to find. <laughs> at the moment, uh, depleting all that stock. Um, but I wanted to join a, a group uh, nearby, you know, find local people who were, um, who were into the same things and, and learn from them. And I didn't think that, uh, you know, it, it made any sense because everything was on lockdown. And had I known that you had these regular meetings, I probably would have joined sooner. So uh, I want to thank Randy for giving me the opportunity. I will show you some of my photos, that, but you know, if you'll indulge me, I'll also give you some background into myself and, and do a proper introduction along the way. Um, hopefully it won't bore you guys. Uh, Wendy, like yourself, I'm, I'm, I'm not a scientist in any, any sense. Uh, in fact, I'm the furthest thing from that. I, I'm more of an artist. Um, and uh, I will share, uh, let me share my, document here before we get too far into it. <laughs> All right. So, um, I think I'm having the same issue. There we go. Can everyone see that? Yep. All right. So, um, this will be my, my journey into astrophotography. I've only been doing this now about a year and a half. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm based in South Mississauga, not far from the lake here in, in Lakeview. And uh, it, it's, been, it's been an interesting journey. This is me. Uh, so my name is Adriano Almeida. I'm an astrophotographer. I, I think I can say that with a little bit of confidence now. It's not something I could have said a few months ago. But um, my background is actually in in industrial design. Uh, I oversee a team of creatives who, you know, work, work in, a, in a creative studio. Um, it, it, like, as I said, it's, it's the strangest thing. It, it's, it has nothing to do with, with what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, but it's always been a dream of mine. And when I started this journey, I, I wanted to start tracking it. So I created a little profile on Instagram, uh, North Stargazer, and um, used that to begin to sort of see, you know, and track my progress. And I, I found a fantastic community there of people who were, you know, very supportive and also, uh, you know, helped to teach me along the way. Um, so that's how you can find me. Uh, I've also, po I also post some stuff on Astrobin and, um, uh, you know, if it's, if it's of a high enough quality. And recently I just joined Twitter. I hadn't had an account there for like 15 years. So um, I, now that Randy and, and the group here are sharing there, I, I committed to, to doing that as well. My wife calls me the man of a million hobbies. I, um, you know, I enjoy, uh, you know, vinyl, playing music, uh, photography, and probably one of my strangest hobbies is collecting and restoring vintage pinball machines and arcade games. Um, you can probably see some behind me here, jukeboxes and whatnot. I think what ties these things all together is that they're, again, they're they're creative. I think there's a creative element uh, and and some technical and I guess even some engineering behind them as well. So I, I think that sort of lends itself well to this endeavor. And, you know, I'm also a child of the 70s and 80s. So, you know, uh, popular media really sort of fueled my passion for science and well, science fiction in this case. And, um, and that sort of grew into uh, a real appreciation for, you know, reading about anything, whether it be fictional or, or, or more scientific. Um, and I think all of these things have conspired together to, to really, you know, drive my passion for for the, the stars um unfortunately i i grew up downtown toronto i spent most of my life down there uh you're not going to see very many stars from from where i was um but i think that made it more special that every time i would get out to you know a dark sky site um i would spend hours sitting there staring uh both from from a, from an aesthetic appreciation you know trying to understand um, you know, what I was seeing and, and the beauty of it all, but then also, you know, a, a lot of philosophical questions would pop into your head, as many of you, I'm sure, have uh, experienced. So this is a, a shot that I took, you know, uh, last year from a, we were at a farm. I was a friend of a friend up in the 
uh, the Grey Highlands or Bruce Highlands. And um, clearly shows the Milky Way. And um, here's the galactic core and the coal sack. And you can see the North American nebula. And I think that might be Garnet Star there and, and, and the elephant trunk. And, and you can clearly see the, um, the uh, summer triangle at Vega, Altair, and Seder. Thank you. I, <laughs> I, I have been learning. Um, so, uh, so I'm glad that I didn't watch that. But unfortunately, you know, this is where I'm based and, and Bortle 8 really sucks. And, and uh, I, I always thought it was sort of a pipe dream. I, I didn't think that there was any rea real way that I could image the, the cosmos. Um, and I don't know what started. I don't remember exactly when. It would have been sort of, you know, spring of, um, of 2020 something must have popped up in my Instagram feed, some beautiful image. And, and, I, and, I, and I started to find people like these guys. And um, I'm really kicking myself that I missed Trevor's talk uh, a couple of weeks back um, because he was certainly one of the first people that pop up. I'm, I'm sure many of you have experienced that as well. Um, he's got some great stuff on there. Uh, people like Dylan O'Donnell as well. But it wasn't so much the technique and, 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 and the technical stuff that they were sharing that appealed to me. It was the fact that they were like me. These were guys who live in similar areas. They're, you know, they have light pollution as well. And, um, and neither of them are scientists as far as I know. So um, they can do this. So I thought, wow, this is awesome. I, I can do it too. So I really started to dive into that. Um, you know, read as many forum posts as I could, uh, eventually found, you know, a gentleman like this is Jerry Lodrigus. I don't know how familiar anyone is with him, but he, he has posted some fantastic tutorials and, and I had no issue paying for his ebook that uh, had a lot of techniques that I still use, you know, every day. So people like this really sort of fueled me into getting into astrophotography. I was already a photographer. I had some equipment. So I thought, okay, great. Let me, let me take stock of what I've got. So, you know, this is what I began with. I had, uh, you know, some lenses. I went out and bought an intervalometer, learned a new word. Um, I um, picked up some clip-in filters. I think that might have been an L Enhance and a L Pro filter. And I got a Botanov mask. And, and, I, and off I went. And uh, I went, I think, to Steve over at um, Ontario Telescope sold me a, uh, an EQM or EQ35M uh, mount and uh, and I, at first i was putting these lenses on here i quickly found out that you know even though these things are built as you know apochromatic and and they have all these beautiful lenses and coatings um really they're not going to stand up to the punishment of a five minute exposure i mean they're great for capturing a rhinoceros at 300 yards but um you know in in nighttime settings they weren't fantastic so I still use some of the wider ones. I sold this big Sigma, which I no longer use. Um, but I decided that I needed to go with prime focus, no more zooms, uh, you know, fewer elements. And uh, this really was my first proper rig. It was an 80 millimeter riding on this uh, EQM35. So I began shooting and this was my first astrobic. And, you know, I kind of laugh a little bit now at it, um, but I, I was over the moon. This thing was like, Boy, I thought I had just cracked it. Um, and, and it really, at, at this point, I felt like I was part of this group, this little special group that, you know, had the ability to look up into the sky and, and, and you know, pull back the curtain a little bit and see things that, you know, we all just take for granted. We're just walking past or under every day. And, uh, and here I am able to image something that I can't see with the naked eye. And, and it's amazing. And there's entire worlds being created up there and dying and, and all, all this great stuff. So this became a, an object that I um, came back to over and over again. So I, I put together a little progression here. And my first step was to get a um, astro modified camera. So I picked up a really cheap sort of used uh, uh, Canon Rebel, which a gentleman in Quebec had astro modified for me, and I started shooting, and I think that, you know, that started to yield some dividends. And soon after that, I was using a uh, dual band filter, which um, a lot of beginners will will gravitate towards. Um, and I started to see a lot of, as in this previous picture, you, you can see there's a lot of walking noise in here. I, again, I'm learning all these fantastic terms, things that I never knew what, what they were and learned how to get rid of them dithering you know who knew um, so that started started to clean things up a little bit um, I started really being critical like things like stars were bloating and how do I get rid of that and and eventually I would 
um, develop a, a better image because maybe I improved my, my processing skills or I, I got a new piece of equipment. I think this was a red cat that I had just purchased. And now I'm putting in instead of, you know, 30 minutes or an hour, which I was doing at first in, in my eagerness, I was jumping around all night, capturing multiple objects thinking, you know, I'm going to get them in five minutes. And, um, you know, then I start to get, you know, five hours and 10 hours and 15 hours. And now things start to look, you know, fairly nice. And, and then I move on to narrow band and I get some filters and I empty out my bank account and I, and, and I'm uh, learning how to assemble um, a Hubble palette image. And then eventually, you know, really learning how to play with colors and, and um, you know, uh, mapping and all sorts of different things. But because I came from a creative background, I had been using, you know, things like Photoshop for years. Um, and I had been a photographer for years, those aspects uh, of the hobby really came easily. And I think that's, you know, that's probably why I've had a sort of an easier time than, than maybe some. Um, what I had to learn was the night sky. I had to learn the technique. I had to learn the, um, you know, how to, how to align a, a polar align a amount. Um, and then patience, I had to learn that as well, of course. So that progression again was, was, a mix of, of um, education and, and, and improved equipment. Um, some of the equipment you can see here, I've already mentioned, um, you know, I, I jumped to, to uh, narrow band, you know, relatively soon into the, into the process. I um, started creating, you know, very small rigs that I could take out uh, in the summertime. Uh, these very flimsy looking little uh, AZ GTIs are fantastic. They are an alt azimuth. Uh, type of um, mount, but you can you can modify them with this wedge, and all of a sudden you've got an equatorial mount, which is um, I think it's like under 500 bucks, and 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 uh, it's computer controlled, and you can just take it anywhere, and it's it's amazing. It, it can carry you know a red cat or a lens, and um, quickly moved away from my Canon, and uh, it's been collecting dust for a few months now, unfortunately, but I. I did get a cooled camera and then another cooled camera and I, you know, I, I was no longer playing my many pinball machines. So I started selling those off and <laughs> converting them into, <laughs> into Astro equipment. Um, so today I, I've got, you know, a few different pieces that I use for a variety of different things, including some solar. Um, and I learned luckily very early on to choose very wisely. Um, one thing that a, a tool that I use a lot is um, Sky Safari. And there's a little tool within Sky Safari called um, Scope Display, I believe, or Scope View, something like that. And what it does is it allows you to enter your equipment in a separate window and, and enter the cameras and the, the, the camera sensors that you're using. And you can pair them. And then it creates a sort of field of view, which you can then turn on and overlay. And I noticed that you know my, my 80 millimeter mead here, when it was reduced, was not that far off from my red cat with a 2600 mm camera on it. And I, and I would see all these people sort of, you know, I've, I've, they buy an 80 millimeter and 100 millimeter, 130 millimeter, and, and they reduce it and increase it and they change the camera size. In reality, you're paying all this money and you're, and you're not getting a lot of reach and, and difference, uh, variation is what I should say. So I set about to create sort of my dream um, set or, or scale here. And you'll see that, you know, the, the smallest box here, which is my Edge uh, HD with a 1600 uh, mm camera is roughly half, you know, one order of magnitude down from the next one, which is uh, 132 millimeter, which is right behind me here. And then the next one is the 80 millimeter and then the Red Cat. And I've got lenses which go beyond this, but, you know, for purposes of moving around the, the app and finding what I want to shoot and what orientation, this is, this is great. And it helps me pick my equipment and it helped me to save some money uh, in not buying things unnecessarily and having to learn that lesson the hard way. So moving on to the, the software, um, I know PixInsight is, is really popular with a lot of astrophotographers. It's expensive. It's hard to learn. I am trying to learn it. Um, but uh, I've, I've always used Photoshop, so that's been my comfort level. A lot of people will stack their subs in Deep Sky Stacker. I did that for a few months and, and then eventually moved over to Astro Pixel Processor, which is, again, it's, it's head and shoulders above Deep Sky Stacker. 
Um, it, it gives you so much control over the entire stacking uh, procedure. It has visualization tools on the, on the right here, which let you uh, auto stretch and even export from there. But it has two things that, that are really great. It, um, it allows you to do a fantastic uh, light pollution removal by selecting certain areas of your image and then it sort of equalizes. So shooting from the city, that is a, a huge, huge plus. And then for people who shoot with a one-shot color camera, where usually you're using, you know, a dual band um, filter like a L Extreme or L Enhance, it has a fantastic algorithm that will strip your color data into H alpha and oxygen separately. So you can get the benefits of shooting, you know, with a one-shot color camera, but then you can also create sort of narrow band. So that then you can go back and create like an HOO composition. Um, and it's really, really good. It's it's actually quite close. So, my oops, sorry. My 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 process is usually um, to um, to process the color shot and then go back and do the HA and the O O three separately. And then I'll use the color shot for my stars, and I will use the, the monochrome images to uh, to compile my my image. I'll take things into Photoshop quickly just to trim them. But very soon, um, one of the things I do differently than than some is I don't wait till the you know to till the image is compiled to remove my stars. I do it right at the beginning um, of my subs so that I have more control and I'm not um, I'm 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 not really sort of waiting till afterwards. And it just works better for me. And then eventually I assemble the image, and I'm probably boring everyone, so <laughs> I'll, I'll quickly pass on the on the software. But um, I, I also use a, a fantastic tool called uh, Denoise by Topaz Labs. Uh, and sometimes it's just that extra little thing that you need to clean up the image. You can go overboard and, and make your image look like a cartoon if you're not careful, um, but it does help. Um, so that's the software. And, and I'll, I'll show you some examples. I, um, I, I won't you know, go into specifics of each shot, but uh, I do a fairly good job on my Instagram posts, at least, of describing what it is I've shot, how much time I've spent the equipment. So I urge you, if you, if you are able to or interested, uh, you can go and check it out there. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it open for Q&A at the end if, if there's anything you guys want to ask. Um, I'll begin with Orion. So these are some shots I've taken around uh, Orion over the last uh, year and a half. So this is uh, the, the main Orion Nebula and the Running Man. I think this was with an 80 millimeter and a 2600 series camera. This is uh, Orion and the horse head and the flame together uh, in a wide field. I believe this was with a, a red cat, 250 millimeter, also with a 2600. But this would have been a one-shot color camera. Um, and this, for this, I used that, that process that I described earlier where I split the color into HA, uh, into O3. And then um, I chose this odd color combination, uh, which I had saw somewhere where the... Um, H alpha is actually mapped to blue instead of red. So it was kind of a unique look. As a kid, I, I, I used to take the same book out of our library all the time. It was this astronomy book and it had the Horsehead Nebula on the cover. So that was always one of my favorite objects. And, and um, when I got the Edge HD just uh, later in the summer this year or last year, um, one of the first objects I wanted to get a close up on was, was that. So that's what we have here. And that, that scope really did open up a lot of doors. Uh, it, you know, there were, there were some amazing objects that I always wanted to shoot and, and you know, they kind of were unimpressive with an 80 mil or even a hundred mil. So um, once I got that big schmidt um, it was it really changed the game for me. So I'm able to now go in and get really close on some of these planetary uh, nebulae like the, the Helix and the Dunbell or Apple Core and, and even the Bubble. And, um, you know, I, I shoot all sizes and, and, and all types of things, but I, I mostly tend to lean towards nebula. Um, I don't do too much uh, broadband. It's difficult in the city, um, but I have tried it. So we have, we've got a nice sort of wider shot of the lagoon and, and the triffid here, and then a close-up of of the triffid, which I believe I shot with the um, the one thirty-two millimeter. And um, this is that really lovely um, sort of bridge that cuts through the Sol Nebula. Uh, you can see the whirling dervish here, kind of, if you look sideways, sort of looks like a, one of those monks sort of spinning with the skirt and so forth. I always really loved that. There's a the great Carl Sagan book, I believe, which has this on the cover. So that was my inspiration for that. Um, 
the tadpoles, I always love the tadpole nebula. And, and what really kind of strikes me about this is even though I, I come at this hobby from a very artistic background, um, I love the science, you know, whenever I can learn about something new and you can just see how this cluster of sort of O-type stars are just irradiating the heck out of the, uh, the gases here. Um, and you, know, you can't see it, but obviously it's just shooting out from, from in these directions. And these, these structures themselves are, are coalescing into, into more and more dense uh, structures, probably with some star formation uh, going on inside. I don't, I don't have a shot of it here, but the Pelican Nebula has these beautiful little, uh, they're almost like a humps with these, these tendrils that come out similar to the tadpoles. And if you look really closely on one of them, you see it has this jet coming out left and right. I think they call them um, Herbig Haro objects or something like that. Maybe someone smarter than me here can, can correct me. But um, what's happening is inside there's a, there's a protostar that's starting to form and it's got a big accretion disk around it, which will eventually become, you know, planets. And the, on the opposite axis, the, um, the magnetic fields are just pushing all of the extra material out of the way and creating these, these jets. Um, and you can actually see them in an astrophoto if you zoom in. So I'm looking forward to, to maybe shooting that in the, in the summertime. Um, this is a recent shot of the uh, Crescent Nebula in HOO, a really shot a lot of the oxygen to try to bring that forward. Um, here's a great shot of the um, Crab Nebula M1. I really pushed the data. You can see it's very sort of jaggedy towards the outside, but I, I did this on purpose because there's, there's this jet um, which is coming out almost like an aorta in a heart. And uh, it's not something that's easy to see. Uh, and uh, I think it's called, caused by the, this pulsar that exists within the, the nebula. It's a leftover of the um, of the supernova and this jet scientists are still sort of you know wondering and studying it and it, it moves a little bit you know from year to year and, and it's really cool to, that it showed up in a I think a 15 hour composition from my backyard so next year maybe I'll get even more of it and then of course this is the um, the uh, pillars of creation and the eagle and this was a close crop taken uh, with the uh, the 132 mil so again, next summer, when uh, I got to ch get a chance, I want to get a little bit closer in there. I was trying to mimic the, the Hubble, you know, palette, trying to even created these false little uh, star spikes, which obviously a refractor will not create. But I, again, I'm an artist, so <laughs> not a scientist. That's always my fallback. Um, I, I haven't done a lot of planetary, but from time to time, the, uh, you know, the mood takes me and I'll, I'll shoot the moon and... Uh, I have used my little solar scope to to get some pretty good results. Um, so I'm looking forward to the increased activity on, on the sun that's coming over the next few years. Um, this is a video actually I captured. It's a time lapse. Um, I tried a few of these with varying success and I got really lucky on this one that in the lower right, I just caught this prominence. So hopefully it'll play for everyone properly. I'll just So hopefully that, that, that came through. Uh, I did it as a loop, so it, it went forward and then backward. So that's why it looks a little funny, but I, I guess that's what solar guys do. Uh, I'm just learning that, so. Oh, there we go. Um, and, and I guess when I think about what, what appeals to me and, and what's made some of my um, images special for me is, um, again, I come at it from, you know, from more of a creative um, angle. I, I understand things like composition and color. Um, and what I notice is that when people are shooting, um, you know, the, the night sky, uh, there's this tendency to not want to throw anything away. You know, like I, I worked hard for that data, man, I'm going to shoot it all. And, and you always see the image, you know, perfectly centered and, and, uh, and, you know, and there's all this stuff around it. And sometimes, you know, that's not necessarily the only way to do it. And, and uh, I think the mo some of my more successful images have just been, you know, going, you know, zooming in deep and, and you know, I, I could have shown the whole Andromeda, but why? I mean, this looks kind of cooler. I think it's a little bit more dramatic. And, and you know, I, one day I, I wanted to shoot the Pleiades, but I didn't have a wide scope. Everybody shoots it really wide because you want to get the, you know, the IFN, the sort of that, that cosmic dust. But 
you know, I, I had a big scope, so I thought, hey, let me do a two panel mosaic. And I ended up with these really beautiful details close up. And, you know, I, I never bothered to building the mosaic in the end. I just kind of kept it the way it was. Um, and you can go the other way with that too. The, the first time that I had gotten the, the larger sensor of the 2600 camera and put it on, on uh, the Red Cat, this field of view that I got when shooting the, the elephant trunk was, was fantastic. I, I know that 80, 90% of the shots we see of this object focus in this region here towards the middle. But when I saw the little delicate, you know, beautiful elements around the outside, I sort of fell in love with this. And, and, um, and, and I thought, wow, you know, maybe, you know, going wide field is something that I can do from time to time. And, and, and that keeps things fresh, I think, for me as well. Um, you can shoot the same object a million different ways. Um, here's another example of that. Not, not the best integration. I probably could use a little bit more. Um, but a lot of people will focus on the Veil Nebula, you know, its elements. And if they do show, show it all as one, it's usually, you know, pointing up and down. And, and here it is sort of almost sort of reclining and pointing towards its um, this nearby star. I can't remember if it's Gamma Cygni or, or something like that. Um, but I think the relationship between the two is, is quite beautiful. And, and um, so I think that's something I'm always looking at in, in, in the work that I'm proposing and, and, and showing. Um, you know, we've all seen images of the uh, Roe Fukai, you know, system and, you know, it always, again, very pulled back with all the tendrils coming off of it, the dark nebula. But there's a lot going on in here that if you zoom in, um, you know, you can see things that you may not have noticed before. Uh, I saw a gentleman do a really close up of this reflection nebula last summer and, and, and I loved it. Um, this image on the right of the uh, Siegel Nebula, it just, it kind of came out of my stacking program upside down. Well, upside down, but um, most people flip it the other way because it looks like a cartoon bird that you would, that you would uh, <laughs> draw. But then I, I had to flip it back to this way because I, I liked it better. And again, just, you know, take a step back or take a step forward. Uh, don't, don't worry about chopping off some of your, your data. It's okay. Um, and probably not the, the best, you know, um, thing to say, but, you know, also know your limits. I, I was, you know, like some people probably thought, ah, you know, I'm, I'm going to be different. I'm going to be that guy that images, you know, the IFN in Portal 8 and, and when, wow, it's going to be awesome. So I can't imagine the hours that I, that I wasted. <laughs> well, it's not wasted because I, I learned something, but um, I certainly could have been shooting something else for 50 hours. And, um, and here I am shooting the, um, the iris. And, and I did eventually through much pain and, and hardship, try, you know, start to show a little bit of that, that flux nebula and the dust and it's, but it's very ruddy and it's not, it's not, it's never going to be a high quality image. And eventually I just sort of gave up and, and sort of uh, took my lumps and said, Hey, I'm going to settle for a you know, close up of the core. And I think that's good enough. And, um, not learning my lesson, I kept going back and doing the same thing with other objects and, and, and doing that again with Roa Fuca and, and here with the uh, M78, which it turned out okay, but not without its hardship and way too many hours. Um, but this core really should be very blue and, and there should be a lot more going on. So um, yeah, I, I guess I need to get out to darker skies. Uh, I don't have a cottage, unfortunately, <laughs> and it's cold right now. But um, I think being able to pick your target, pick your battles is also an important lesson that uh, the young astrophotographer uh, or new astrophot astrophotographer should learn. So, um, and this is my last slide. So now I'm sort of looking at what, what's next for me. Um, certainly immediately, uh, as Sharia pointed out, there are some, there, there are fewer you know, objects in the, in the sky, galaxy season is, is upon us. And I, I want to start to build and, and improve on some of these last year's uh, shots. Um, there's some great globular clusters out there like the one here in Hercules. Um, in the lower right is a really poor attempt at, at um, Jupiter. Uh, although I, I did get a really nice shadow from its moon, I believe it's Europa. Um, and I really want to spend more time uh, doing some lunar and certainly some solar. And I've already begun my 2022 uh, galaxy campaign. This is a very early uh, integration of M, uh, M82, I believe, Cigar Galaxy. So that's what's up. Um, and uh, hopefully I'll be able to share many more with you guys. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I'll, I'll stop talking now. <laughs>
Thank you so much, Adriana. Oh my gosh, that's a, a lot of us, to, a lot for us to digest. Any any questions for, uh, for Adriana? What a journey in the last uh, couple of years. It's been great. Yeah. yeah. William, did you have something? Yes. How long have you been doing this? So, um, it would have been around July, August of 2020. Would that's have been it. when I, I got my. That's it. I quit. <laughs> Start swearing now. Yeah. <laughs> oh wow, that's excellent. You can, fantastic. You can tell the difference with an artist. Wow. Yeah. yeah. He's he's got the eye. Chris. Uh, so Adriano, I, you. When you were showing those last images, um, uh, you're having some difficulty with the reflection nebula. I remember reading only a few weeks ago in one of the astronomy magazines, I forget which one it was, saying that from a Bortle 8 sky, like from the city, um, it's much better to do uh, ionized regions, like a H alpha type of thing, not reflection nebula, because that, that's a wide amount of spectrum. It's not just sort of a narrow yeah. band thing. So I'm wondering if that's why you're having a bit of, although your pictures are fantastic, uh, despite the city, that's, you're a bit disappointed, I think, because of the reflection nebula part for that reason. Like, I oh, that's, to that's totally why. That, that was me being totally cocky and thinking that I could do what other people had not done. <laughs> so yes, you, you're 100% you're correct. Uh, you know, shooting in, in a light polluted zone, like, like where we are, um, you, you want to be getting narrow band as much as possible. You, I mean, you can do some broadband like the Pleiades and, and uh, Andromeda, but there are very bright, very prominent broadband targets. Uh, the more subtle ones like the ones I tried were just way out of my league, um, way, way out of anyone's league really from, from a, a white zone, so. But Pleiades uh, is um, reflection nebula and your, your view of the Pleiades, like the Merope nebula and the nebulosity around the other stars are just like unbelievable like it was fantastic despite the fact that that's a reflection nebula there yeah it's because they're so they're so much more bright than any other example um so that plays into it so the the brighter something is it, it also it almost becomes like shooting daytime like you know obviously if you're shooting in daytime you're you know your your camera's going to pick up a lot more more data and the same is true of uh, of the Pleiades and Andromeda, but when you start shooting M seventy eight or the Iris, they're they're much more faint, and you, you'll you'll get the the bright stuff in the center, but you won't resolve anything else. Basic question: When you say that your processing is H O O, does that mean H is red channel, O is uh, green, O and the other O is blue? Yeah, correct. So. Um, when I started moving over to narrowband again, I had to learn what all these things meant. So I, I, I learned that the Hubble palette was, uh, you know, sulfur, sulfur would go to red. I mean, every image is RGB, so it's, it's always going to be red first, green second, and be blue third. So your, your gases or your, your, your materials sort of follow the same. So if it's SHO, it's uh, S goes to red hydrogen to yeah. green. green and, and uh, exactly and then oxygen, oxygen to blue. blue yeah thanks oh and your uh, your stacking program to use it's something called was it astral pixel something or other yeah app so uh astral pixel processor okay. um it, it looks daunting at first it's got a lot of buttons and lots of little blinky things um but boy is it ever is it ever better? And um, if anyone here is into this stuff and, and, and has questions or about the software I mentioned, just drop me a line and I'm happy to, to explain uh, or help. Adriana, is that a Windows only or Mac or both? Or? Hmm. Uh, that's a good question. I, I seem to remember when I downloaded that they do offer Linux and I, I'm, I'm almost positive they've got Mac as well. Okay. Any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Oh my God, what a journey. Uh, hey, you're welcome, thank you. Yeah, really, uh, thank you for sharing this and uh, uh, congratulations. Uh, Thanks, it's great to meet everyone finally and I look forward yeah. to seeing you guys. Well, yeah, we'll look forward to uh, 
to meeting you face to face very, very soon. Thanks very much. No problem. Okay, our last uh, speaker is uh, Jagjit Singh. He's going to uh, give us an overview on something that's been in the news recently, which is the uh, uh, James Webb uh, Telescope, which uh, actually, uh, I don't know if you saw today, but it actually uh, 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 released a selfie of itself, uh, but they're uh, at a point where they're in the post, uh, um, I guess, reaching its uh, position, uh, uh, aligning its mirrors, but I'm gonna let uh, uh, Jagjit talk about that. Jagjit, you want to uh, uh, present this? I'll uh, bring up your presentation if I can. Um, yeah, hi. Uh, so Randy, I think I can share my screen. Um, oh, you can? So, okay. Yeah, so let me just... Um, yeah, do it. Yeah, oh, well, you're all set. Hey, there you go. Okay, perfect. Am I audible as well? You are. Let me switch off this title. Looks, looks okay. good. Go for it. <laughs> well, hi everyone. Um, happy to meet you all. Um, my name is Jagjeet, and I'm going to be speaking on the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, just like most on the call today, I also carry a lot of passion in physics. Uh, in fact, I always wanted to be an astrophysicist, but somewhere I got lost in my direction. Um, that said, my passion stayed on though. And, you know, since childhood, I have always tried to keep myself uh, abreast with the latest on new discoveries in, in both the fields, which is uh, astrophysics and quantum mechanics. Um, I will avoid any type of technical details uh, as much as possible and keep the presentation at a very conceptual level for everyone to understand. Uh, that said, in the end, uh, you know, in the last couple of slides, it might get a little bit heavier, but, uh, you know, I'll do my best just to uh, give you the bigger picture. Um, so let's dive right in, I guess. Okay. Um, so I'm sure uh, most on the call are aware of the James Webb Space Telescope. I'll just refer it to as JWST or Webb, uh, moving on. Uh, the telescope is an infrared space observatory that launched, uh, I believe, in December uh, of last year. Uh, it's NASA's most powerful and largest space telescope, uh, which will probe the cosmos to uncover the uh, history of the universe from the Big Bang to alien planet formation. Um, according to NASA, uh, the web will focus on four main areas, uh, which is the first light in the universe, assembly of galaxies in the early universe, uh, birth of stars and protoplanetary systems and planets. Um, I will be covering that in a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides, but before I do that, let's just, took, just, just take a look at the uh, JWST, how it came into existence. Uh, so it took more than 25 years to come into existence, and the project initially was named as the Next Generation Space Telescope. Um, in 2002 is when the project was renamed after NASA's second administrator, which is James E. Webb, and he led the uh, agency during the Apollo program. Uh, what you see, uh, the table on the left-hand side is, you know, the planned budget and, sorry, the planned launch dates and total budget. And just like any other R&D project, you know, uh, the, the timelines got pushed, the budget got inflated, and by the time this project uh, was launched, you know, um, NASA had spent almost $10 billion on it. Um, but that said, you know, uh, the, the way this project came to fusion was because of Hubble's success, right? Uh, HSD was able to take these deep field images of the universe, uh, and it was able to re reveal, um, you know, with such large, such detail, large number of galaxies and very young galaxies. Um, so Hubble Deep Field became a landmark image in the study of the early universe. Um, that said, though, it still had its limitations. Uh, so NASA started to explore the concept of a larger and much colder infrared uh, telescope that could reach back in cosmic time to the birth of the first galaxies. Uh, the high priority science goal was beyond the Hubble's capability because as a warm telescope, uh, it is blinded by infrared emission from its own optical system. Uh, and the image you see is the uh, Hubble Deep Field uh, image, which was taken in 1995. Okay, so Webb is nothing short of an engineering marvel. 
Um, so this is the overall components that is present on web. Um, so web has two sides. It is divided by its sun shield, which you see right in the middle. Uh, the hot side is facing the sun and earth, uh, and the cold side is facing into the space, away from the sun and earth. The solar panels, uh, the communication antenna, navigation system, electronics reside on the hot side, which faces the sun. Uh, the mirrors, the scientific instruments, uh, the detectors, uh, which any instrument which is very sensitive to infrared radiation is on the other side or the colder side um, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, observatory, which is protected by the sun shield right in the middle. Um, there are four instruments, uh, scientific instruments or detectors on, um, uh, on the web, which is housed in the uh, integrated science instrument module, which you see on the top left side. Um, they together, I mean, they work together to fulfill two objectives. One is to imaging of cosmic objects, and the second part is spectro sorry, spectroscopy, which is uh, pretty much breaking down the light into separate wavelengths to study cosmic matters, physical and chemical properties. So more on that a little bit on other slides. Um, the mirror, well, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's the highlight. Um, the mirror and instruments are protected uh, by the sun shield in the middle, but the mirror is about six and a half feet, uh, sorry, six and a half meters wide. It has 18 uh, hexagonal um, uh, components or hexagonal mirrors, which come together to make this one big piece of mirror. Uh, so the bigger the mirror, the more light it's able to capture and more precision it's able to get um, for those far distant objects. <clears throat> The telescope also has a spacecraft bus, which is on the hotter side of the telescope, uh, which really is into, I mean, it, it, it supports the electrical power, the propul propulsion system, communication, and you know, the other, other equipments. Uh, the antenna is used to, um, to communicate with the controllers uh, on Earth, uh, share that data or whatever has been collected by James Webb uh, back to Earth. Uh, the star tracker is interesting. This is where the CSA has contributed a bit more, um, but it is, uh, it, it uses star guides or guide stars, sorry, uh, for course pointing of the telescope. So the star tracker data enables the alignment and control system to point the telescope uh, so that the target appears in the field of view of the intended instrument. And once an observation is locked, uh, the fine guidance sensors um, can compensate for small drifts in the observatory's alignment and help the uh, telescope uh, maintain its good pointing. And finally, the momentum tab, that's kind of an important piece as well, because, uh, well, you know, first of all, it, uh, the purpose is to maintain the observatory's orientation to minimize the fuel required uh, to make corrective adjustments uh, during the mission. So the Canadian Space Agency has provided some really critical instrumentation to JWST uh, and its mission. So there are two components that have been provided. One is a fine guided sensor. Um, so like I uh, discussed earlier, the sensor required to point the telescope uh, at an astronomical target and hold that target steady. Um, so these sensors lock onto the stars and you know that's how they're able to maintain that precision um, from, from James Webb's Point of view, it's it's probably going to be a dot. It's not even going to be a dot. It's, it's much dimmer than that. So that precision is required, and uh, any sort of small fluctuation will cause it to blur that image or not able to uh, kind of record it properly. Um, but really, this is an interesting fact which I was able to pull out of uh, the CSA website. And to put it into perspective, the Canadian made sensor is so sensitive that it can detect a tiny angular displacement equivalent to the thickness of a human hair as seen from one kilometer away. Or you could say that's like spotting someone blink in Toronto all the way from Montreal. So it's a highly sensitive and really precise instrument. Um, so kudos to that uh, from CSA. And the other uh, instrument that was provided by CSA was the near infrared imager and slitless spectrograph. And like I mentioned earlier, spectrograph is used to determine the composition of exoplanet and its atmosphere. So two main components and, uh, you know, amazing to see CSA contribute to this, uh, to this endeavor. 
Uh, very quickly, this is the commission, commissioning timelines for JWST. I think we are around 45 or 45, 46 days since launch. So it is in the cooling phase. Uh, so next couple of months will be spent into calibrating the mirrors um, and also checking the equipment if they're working correctly. Um, and then once that is completed, another month or so, a little longer than that will be spent in the system integration part, which is to make these components work together uh, to bring, it, bring out the desired results. So we're looking uh, at a total time of six months. Well, um, almost 40, 45 days are in. So we still have, I mean, NASA still has a lot of work to, uh, uh, to do, I guess. <laughs> This is a snapshot from NASA's website. This is a live tracker of the James Webb Space Telescope. Uh, so you can see points A and B, which is on the hotter side. It is, it is at 96 Fahrenheit, which, which is like the Canadian summers here, 33 degrees Celsius, probably around that much. Uh, the colder side is running very cold, 52 Kelvin. That should be around 220, 230, uh, minus 220, uh, minus 230 degrees Celsius. Um, and then you can see some equipment stats over there as well. Um, now I will be getting a little bit into the science part of things. Uh, so I definitely wanted to touch on the L2 orbit, which is a Lagrange orbit. And why does um, the Webb telescope have to be cool? Okay, the Lagrange point are, point are positions in space where the gravitational forces of two body systems like the sun and earth, in this case, produce enhanced regions of attraction and repulsion, uh, which precisely equals to the force required for a small object to move with them. So in this case, it will be the telescope itself. So these are five special points. Uh, the one, the image that you see on the, uh, uh, on the left-hand side. Um, and there are the L1, L2, and the L3 are unstable orbits. Um, L4 and L5 are stable orbits. Uh, more on that a little bit later. But L2 point is, and, and L2 means Lagrange point two. Um, so L2 point is about one and a half million kilometers away from Earth or about four times distance between Earth and Moon, uh, which puts the L2 orbit beyond the servicing range. Uh, so if anything were to go wrong, unlike the Hubble telescope, uh, which was fixed, JWST will be on its own. So there's a lot riding on uh, things going right and fingers crossed. Um, so, uh, you know, L L2 point uh, of the Earth and Sun system was home. It's not new. It was home to the uh, Wilkinson microwave, uh, microwave anisotropy probe, which is the WMAP Planck. Um, uh, and also now uh, for JWST. Um, and L2 is ideal for astronomy because a spacecraft is close enough to readily communicate with Earth um, and keep the sun, Earth, and moon behind the spacecraft in alignment for solar power. And also with appropriate shielding, uh, provide a clear view of the deep space for our telescope. Now, despite these advantages, L2, like I mentioned earlier, it has an unstable orbit. Uh, for approximately 23 days, so which requires the satellite uh, orbiting these positions to undergo regular course correction. So this is one of the reasons why JW JWST's lifespan will depend on how efficiently the observatory uh, uses fuel to keep itself in orbit. Um, apart from giving merit and time for projects to use JWST, the projects will also be scheduled in such a way to ensure that JWST's movement is minimized to reduce fuel consumption and to extend its life. Uh, we are looking at anywhere between 10 to 20 years of operation. Oh, okay, there was another video here. Yeah, so that's how it will... Um, uh you know how it's aligned to earth and how it will orbit there you go so that's how it it's going to look okay so one of james uh jwst's science goal is to look back through time when galaxies were young um and well do web will do this by observing galaxies that are very distant uh, you're looking at there, it's going to look at beyond 13 billion light years from us. 
And to see such far objects and such faint objects, Webb needs an extremely large mirror, which it already has, which is the 18 hexagonal mirrors. Um, but there is one challenge, though, is that we need to keep Webb's mirrors um, uh, cold in order to see those very first stars and galaxies. Uh, and the reason is because their light has been shifted from visible light uh, to infrared because the universe is expanding. And as the distances between these galaxies stretch, uh, the light from the, them also stretch towards the redder wavelength, right? So that's the image on top over there. Um, Hubble was, you know, uh, somewhere in the visible and um, uh, near infrared and Webb is far into the, it's, it's into the mid infrared range. So it's, it's able to capture the longer wavelengths of, uh, of the infrared range. <clears throat> Uh, so this is a reason, and this is a phenomenon called as a redshift. And what this really means is that object can be quite dim at visible wavelength, but at the infrared ones, it could be quite bright. Um, so web needs to be extremely cold, and its mirrors have to be around minus 220 degrees. Um, and it also must be able to withstand such cold uh, temperatures and hold its shape uh, so that there is no distortion in the images that it captures. Now, there are two ways web achieves um, the cooling. Um, so the first part is called as a passive cooling, uh, which is pretty much provided by the sun shield itself. Uh, so through passive cooling, um, three of Webb's four scientific instruments, uh, which see the reddest of the wavelength, are able to operate with that passive cooling and you know being that operational range. Um, but there's one instrument which is the uh, mid infrared or called as the MIRI instrument which observes uh, infrared wavelengths at a very um, the longer wavelength so it, it observes from the 5 micron to 28 micron wavelength uh, so that has to be extremely cold and that cold cannot be achieved, that type of temperatures cannot be achieved with passive cooling. So the MIR, MIRI instrument or the detector has its own cryo cooler. Uh, it operates at seven Kelvin, which is just a couple of degrees above absolute zero. Um, so there you go. So that's, uh, that's the reason why uh, you know, the mirrors and the instruments have to be extremely cold is uh, because of this shift in uh, wavelength. Okay, so this is where things uh, start to get a little bit heavier. Um, you know, the question I always have is, you know, NASA spent almost $10 billion, 25 years into the making, why? <laughs> and, you know, I mean, why do we need such a powerful telescope? Why, why do we want to see the first stars and galaxies that were formed? The answer to the second question is pretty straight. We don't have the pictures for first stars and galaxies. Uh, even with all the equipments that we have, we don't have a picture of it. Uh, the furthest back that we have been able to see is the picture on your top right-hand side, which is the galaxy GNZ11. Uh, which is about 13.4 billion light years and was captured by Hubble. And well, you can see it's, it's not in the usual modern day galaxy, which is ellipt elliptical or spiral in nature. It's obviously in its early stages, but that's not a very clear picture, but that's what <laughs> the best Hubble could do. Um, and this is where James Webb Space Telescope fills in the gap, right? So the image below is uh, kind of like the cosmic history uh, that you're seeing. And I, I believe I saw a similar image in uh, Wendy's uh, slide as well. So I'll be just kind of taking you a little bit more into detail into this phase and where James Webb's space telescope really fits in. So right after the Big Bang, the universe was like a hot soup of particles, it had protons, neutrons, and electrons all just in a swarm. Um, and at this point, the universe was opaque. And uh, light had been stopped from traveling freely because it would frequently scatter with the free electrons that were kind of just roaming around in space. Um, now, when the universe started to cool, though, the protons and neutrons kind of began combining, combining into ionized atoms or early stage ionized hydrogen and helium. And then, you know, when the electrons joined in, they became neutral atoms. Now, once they became a neutral atom, um, what happened was light was able to move freely without being impeded. Uh, and that's where you, you know, get those dark ages 
and everything after that. But what's interesting here is that this is the earliest point in our cosmic history to which we can look back with any form of light. So right, this, this process of particle pairing is called as a recombination stage, and this is what you see in the timeline. And this is what we see from the cosmic microwave background. Um, today with satellites like, uh, like the WMAP that I explained earlier and the Cosmic Microwave Background Explorer. So this is what they captured. They captured the cosmic uh, microwave background uh, in the recombination phase. <clears throat> and everything after that was dark ages till you know, those first stars and galaxies started to form. Um, but then there's something else that happened. Uh, the universe just formed a little bit or these stars and galaxies formed too fast and they were too big. Uh, and then we entered into a phase called its reionization. The theory predicts here that the first stars were 30 to 300 times as massive as our sun and million, millions of times brighter, uh, burning only a few million years before exploding as a supernova. Now, the energy was so immense that it was able to split those hydrogen atoms again back into ionized hydrogen atoms, so stripping the atom away from, from its electron. Um, which is quote unquote why it's called as the reionization phase, right? Uh, now this era from the first star to the end of reionization is of great importance to us and which is where the James Webb St Space Telescope is really gonna focus on, right? The ultra deep field, the really trying to look back. Um, so A, you know, the, the web, it will help us answer, uh, help us better understand the formation of early stars and galaxies. And not only that, but also why there's a supermassive black hole at the center of the mo at, at most galaxies. B, of particular importance, <laughs> is the role of dark matter and dark energy in shaping the early universe. Uh, it will also help in solving the mystery of the Hubble tension, which has become one of the most pressing problems in cosmology today. Uh, I won't go deep into it. Uh, maybe that could be another topic next time, but um, that is something that a lot of the uh, astrophysicists are eagerly waiting to get data on and get that sorted out immediately because statistically, uh, there have been some differences which are really concerning now. It's either we don't understand, we have to tweak our model of the uh, standard model of cosmology, or we might have to change some other uh, measurement technique, which in both cases for me, it's, it's a big change. So, um, so yeah, so it's, uh, it's gonna kind of answer a very important question. And also what the, what the web will be able to do is through its powerful infrared instruments, it will be able to see through the dust and thick clouds that is generally present in the early stages of star formation and peer back into it. So it will be kind of like be able to see through it and see what's behind it. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so the Hubble did a fantastic job in kind of observing the modern day galaxies, um, you know, for, with, with whatever technology it had. Uh, the WMAP and the Planck kind of went all the way back to the beginning, right 250,000 years after the Big Bang and captured the microwave background. James Webb Telescope will capture in between. So right from the first stars to the reionization phase, and which will give us a better understanding of how the universe formed and you know where we are in this big picture of things. And Another important aspect, uh, you know, uh, another important thing that the James Webb will focus on is um, habitable planets and search of habitable planets. And this is where the spectrograph provided by the CSA is going to be a forefront of the mission. Uh, we have discovered close to 5,000 exoplanets uh, till date, not to mention a few orbiting our closest star, which is Proxima uh, Centauri. Um, astrobiologists are in search for habitable exoplanets. Uh, since we want to be mindful of how best to utilize our resources, only transiting planets will be observed because transit planets allow the studies of the atmosphere, if any, uh, that are not possible from non-transiting planets. And the way this works is when a planet transits in front of its host star, the light from the star interacts with the planet's atmosphere, uh, which then travels hundreds and thousands of light years, gets detected by this really thin sliver by the telescope. In this case, it will, be, it will be JWST. The light is then spread into a rainbow and scrutinized for chemical fingerprints uh, 
the atmosphere leads on the light. So, you know, with this chemical footprint, uh, astrobiologists will be able to look at the atoms, molecules, you know, what is the composition of the stratosphere, cloud winds, and if there are any microbes in the atmosphere, they will be able to pick that up as well. So a little bit sign of life as well. So, well, this is the last slide. Uh, so this brings me to the end of my presentation. It's an exciting time to be around. Um, the next decade is gonna be a game changer in cosmology. So nothing less than rewriting the history of cosmos and reshaping humanity's position in it. Um, hope you enjoyed the presentation. I'll open it up for questions. Thank you very much. Oh my gosh, uh, James, that was a great summary of uh, James Webb up to uh, to write about this point as they uh, commission it or get it, all the mirrors lined up so they can start to take uh, take images. I just uh, saw some, there was an actual uh, uh, press conference today. They were talking about lining all, lining all the mirrors, so they're well on their way. Any questions for uh, Jagjit about his, uh, his talk tonight? Yeah, um, Adriana. I've got a million questions, but I'll, uh, that last one about uh, being able to pick up uh, organic elements in the atmosphere is fantastic. But my, my, my first question is more of a, one of an engineering. Um, the, the sun shield, I'm, I'm assuming, has to be positioned in sort of a perpendicular uh, orientation to, the, to the, it's the pass it takes around the sun. Um, does the scope is always shown in rendering sort of at a sort of a similar plane to its sun shield can it actually rotate and sort of be pointed more perpendicularly so that it, it or is it is it limited in its movements to sort of uh where its orbit is taking it um wow okay so that's uh i i'm not going to be able to answer this with 100 percent confidence uh but i am assuming if uh, one of the objective is to minimize the movement of James of the telescope and the way it's pointing. I'm assuming that um, it might have a capability, but it will not be kind of used very extensively just because, um, you know, they just want to, I mean, one of the purposes is to extend the life as far as possible. So uh, of the telescope. So um, I won't be able to answer that hundred percent. Maybe someone on the call can, uh, but yeah. Uh, maybe I can chime in. Um, the, there are motion wheels on the telescope, just like uh, there was on Hubble, uh, or is on Hubble, which uh, you know they don't so that it, they don't use fuel to position the telescope to where they, exactly they want to point. Uh, although they can use the fuel to uh, essentially derotate out the, the momentum wheels, uh, but the only Restrictions really are that the uh, the telescope has to you know keep the um, solar shale uh, in between it and the sun. So as it goes around the sun, obviously there are uh, the uh, objects that it can observe change, uh, but uh, it has does it has some freedom as to uh, observing things. Uh, um, based on its position. <clears throat> Does that help? Yeah, yeah, it's not directly coupled to the heat shield. No, exactly. There, there, is, some, uh, there is some freedom to that. Great. Questions? Quest yeah, question. How confident do you think JWT will be able to resolve the dispute between the Hubble constant? Because <laughs> there, there seem to be two different values depending on how far they're looking back in time and they can't seem to resolve the differences. Correct. Um, so if you were to ask me, I am very positive it will be able to answer that question. Um, so just to uh, give a quick background. So there is the late light method and there's the early light method. The early light is the one that I spoke about was the cosmic uh, microwave background. The late light is more towards relative uh, distances relative to Earth, so it's called the cosmic ladder. So these two method of understanding the expansion of the universe produce two different results. And uh, for the early light, which is a cosmic uh, microwave background, 
uh, the expansion of the universe is at 67 or 69 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Megaparsec is uh, about 3.26 million light years in width. So every 3.26 uh, million light years, the, the universe is expanding uh, 69 kilometers faster. Whereas the other measurement uh, has about 73 or 74 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Now this is statistically very wide and concerning. Um, so what the James Webb telescope would do is it will not be able to, uh, it's, not, it's not contesting the early light method because that is anyway captured by the WMAP or Planck. What it will contest or what it will try to prove right or wrong is the late light method, which is the cosmic ladder method, which we, yeah. which, which a lot of the other scientists use to measure the expansion of the universe. So yes, uh, I'm pretty confident we'll be able to uh, either agree or disagree with that method completely. Or, or there's something that we don't completely understand. Mm -hmm. uh, or there's something we don't completely understand about the expansion of the universe. Yes, uh, and that, that would mean rewriting the standard model, model of cosmology or even having a look at general relativity for that matter. So uh, yeah, so big time's coming up. <laughs> or whether dark matter exists or not, or dark energy exists or not. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions for uh, Jajit there? Okay, well, I think we'll be following this uh, for quite a while. And uh, I think we're, we'll make efforts to bring in people who are directly uh, uh, related to using the, uh, the telescope as, as possible. I know that uh, we have connections with, uh, with uh, people who are directly uh, uh preparing to use it in that the in the canadian uh astronomy uh environment so that's great so thanks everyone for uh all the art thanks to all our presenters tonight that was a a, a really awesome uh you know presentation uh, list of presentations and uh um very enjoyable uh let me uh just say a few words about our next meeting two weeks from tonight we have our annual meeting uh, this is a, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to look back at the, uh, the last uh, calendar year or financial year and uh, for the council to report to our membership on, uh, on our activities. Uh, once again, another COVID year, uh, but we did, uh, I think we were quite active uh, at least uh, online. And uh, one aspect of, uh, of this is that uh, um, our income is exceeding our expenses. And uh, we've been looking at this for, for many years now. Um, uh, the, the makeup of a, of a center of the RASC is, uh, is generally such that uh, um, the, income is fixed based on number of members, uh, but the expenses are based on various things. Uh, I remember uh, years ago when I was involved with the Toronto Center, is that uh, a major uh, expense was uh, our newsletter, which uh, was something which was printed and mailed out to members. And back then we had over a thousand members, so there was uh, quite an expense. Uh, we don't have a, uh, a printed uh, and mailed uh, newsletter. And in fact, our expenses are rather limited compared to our, uh, our income. So we've been able to accumulate a fair amount of revenue uh, into our bank account over the past uh, 20 years. And uh, well, not 20 years, but uh, we've certainly uh, been a center for over 15 years now. Um, and we've we've looked at this and members have, have commented on the, the fact that we have some money in the bank account over twenty thousand twenty thousand dollars. And uh, this is something that we want to talk about at our annual meeting in two two weeks tonight. And I wanted to uh, let everyone know that this is a, a topic that we'll be talking about. Um, all of the uh, documents 
uh, for the uh, annual meeting are in uh, Messenger that was uh, put online uh, last week. So if you go into our website and uh, access that, you'll be able to see the agenda for the annual meeting and uh, the financial uh, statements and uh, a list of our uh, projected council for 2022. Um, and one of the discussions we will have is uh, what to do uh, with the surplus. We've, uh, the finance committee had a meeting recently and we'll report on that and our, our discussions over that. I mean, it's always nice. It's nice to have a problem where you've got too much money, uh, but then realistically, uh, you know, the uh, Mississauga Center is not a bank. So uh, we need to uh, uh, make some decisions uh, at the council level as to what to do uh, with the money. And, uh, and we're looking to uh, the members of the, uh, the center to, um, to suggest ideas. Um, we had, do have some uh, suggestions and we'll uh, uh, propose them at the, uh, at the annual meeting. Uh, but I just want to let every know, everyone know that that's one thing that we will, uh, we will talk about. Um, so that's all I have. Are there any questions, comments before we uh, adjourn for the night? Okay, I don't see any. So uh, thank you very much uh, for attending. Uh, a good uh, turnout tonight. Uh, thank you very much for uh, our presenters, uh, some of them for the first time, which is always uh, awesome. And uh, we will see you in uh, two weeks. <clears throat> and I think in two weeks from now, we'll have a better idea. Uh, I mean, we are in touch with UTM uh, about, uh, you know, the uh, possibility of returning to UTM for meetings. Uh, we are planning uh, um, a star party with the uh, UTM astronomy department uh, for March 7th. Uh, we'll certainly let everyone know about that because even if you don't bring out a tele bring a telescope or whatever, it'd be great to have a lot of people come out and just see each other because that'll be the first opportunity we see everyone for a long, long time. Um, but again, that has not been confirmed as the uh, restric restrictions are uh, pulled back in the province. And uh, maybe by then uh, we will be able to uh, um, um, have a, an astronomy uh, evening for, uh, for UTM and the, the new astronomer there, Lee, Dr. Lee Hirsch. Uh, but also, uh, you know, we're always anxious or willing to uh, uh, participate with the UTM for various uh, uh, activities, uh, you know, and, and bring our expertise to the uh, university to help out astronomy-wise, but also be the first opportunity for us to get together in two years, which is uh, which is amazing. So uh, we'll certainly let everyone know um, let everyone know what's going on. Um, our uh, speaker nights are actually set for a couple months. Whereas they're still going to be remote because our speakers are uh, are not local, uh, but uh, if suddenly things opened up, uh, we would be able to hold our potpourri meetings uh, at the university. So as you know, you can't predict anything in a COVID environment, and it's all basically day to day. But we'll certainly let everyone know what's uh, what's going on, and. Uh, all I can say is look, I really look forward to getting together with everybody uh, for the first time in two years and, uh, and having a meeting. So with that, thanks for coming out. Thank you to our speakers. We'll see you in two weeks at our annual meeting, a very important meeting where we uh, talk about uh, essentially uh, the center's activities in 2021. But all otherwise, um, stay safe, take care and uh, I really look forward to seeing you uh, in a couple of weeks and face to face really soon. Thank you very much. Good night, Randy. Good night, everybody. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Presentations. Thank you. Stay safe. Good night. Hey, bye. Hello, everyone. Good night. <laughs>